Well, this week uh, I went in to get, uh, it's kind of a, I guess, a, a desert uh, hallmark. I went in to get some spots removed. And uh, the spot that I had removed was a spot that had already been removed. And so then the doctor said this hardly ever happens because it was Mohs surgery and they had margins, but they had to go in and get it. And then he didn't get it, so they had to go back and get it again. So it was a, a deeper and, and wider uh, wound than, than, uh, than, than expected, and it's right on my shoulder. Uh, do you want to show? Want to see it? No, I'm the, I would do that, but I don't want to embarrass you. I would be uh, if, you, if I showed you my, my mark. But all of us have uh, wounds that we don't show for one reason or another. But all of us have been wounded and in, in the emotional, not just the physical, but the emotional or the spiritual, the mental. We have wounds that we don't tell anybody about. And if we don't deal with them, it'll kill you. And I want, I want to talk today about somebody you know probably not very well. His name is Ahithophel. Ahithophel, who is that? You'll know by the end of this morning. Uh, we're doing a series on overcoming uh, Nike, Nike, the, the goddess of victory. And overcoming is, is uh, what the Lord has for us, is that you'll be an overcomer. And so I want to talk about overcoming hurt today. And you say, well, I don't have hurt. If you live and breathe, you've been hurt. Look around you. I mean, people look good. And they look like they've got no problems. I want to tell you something. Everybody here has been hurt. What you do with those hurts will, to a large part, determine how happy you are and really how successful you are. Now, Ahithophel was uh, the, the chief counselor for David. In the Old Testament, we're, we're, I want to just read a couple of scriptures to set the tone for you. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 12 says, Then Absalom sent for Ahithophel, the Gilanite. Uh, this is when, when Absalom decided he was going to take over and he was going to do a rebellion against his dad, David. And so he called for the wisest guy that he knew. His name was the fifth Hithophel uh, from his city, namely Gilo, while he offered sacrifices. And the conspiracy grew strong for the people with Absalom continually increased in number. So he was a, uh, a counselor, but not just a guy with, with uh, wisdom. Uh, the scripture says uh, later on in chapter 16, that the counsel which Ahithophel gave, he gave as, as if one inquired of the oracle of God. It's like God speaking. That he had such insight and such spirit-filled wisdom that when he spoke, uh, the Lord, the Lord was speaking. And you say, that's that. So he was a counselor first and foremost to David. But then something happened. What happened? Well, the second thing that, that he was, was he was a dad. He was a father of, of in, in Again, 2 Samuel chapter uh, 23 is, is uh, where David gives his mighty men. And all those who, this guy killed 800, this guy killed 300, this guy, all of this. But it says, in, just tucked away in this, it says, and Eliam, the son of Ahithophel, the Giloite. What does that mean? It means that Ahithophel was a counselor, but he was a dad, but he was a dad for one of the mighty men of David, the guys who would sacrifice their lives to serve the country and to serve David. And also, down in verse 39, it says, and Uriah the Hittite, 37 and all, it's telling how many people that they killed. And Uriah killed 37 men. When, when he was sent in there and David sent that message to go back from them, uh, before he died, he killed 37 people. This, is, this was one tough hombre. So Ahithophel was a counselor, a father, and a grandfather. His, his granddaughter was, uh, you, we see that in, in, in chapter 11. Now, if being the chief counselor, you understand he had access to the palace. So he was coming and going all the time. And so he wanted his family around him. And so his granddaughter lived just below him. And uh, that's with Eliam, her dad. And then... Uh, Verse 11 of 2 Samuel. It happened in the, in the spring when, when kings go out to battle. David didn't go. Then it happened one evening that David rose from his bed and walked out on the roof of the king's house. And he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was beautiful to behold. 
And David sent and inquired about the woman. And, and they're trying to give him a warning right now. And someone said, is that not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite, and the granddaughter of Ahithophel, your counselor? Well, you know what happened. He fell into a sinful relationship with, with her and, uh, and that he became so bitter and so angry inside, so hurt. Anger is, is not a primary emotion. Uh, hurt is. When you're hurt, it, it comes out oftentimes as anger, but it's really hurt. When somebody's angry with you, they're not really angry, they're hurt. And so you look for the primary emotion. The primary emotion uh, is hurt. And so uh, I want to talk to you this morning about dealing more wisely than Ahithophel did because Ahithophel didn't deal with it all. He just put it away, but he got angry. He got angry. He didn't go in and confront David. We were never told that he went in and confronted David. He just, what he did was he started conspiring against him. And he took sides with Absalom. In fact, if, if Absalom had listened to Ahithophel's uh, counsel, David would be, would be gone because he said, he's running now. He's going up the, if he'd been to Israel, he'd been up the, he was going up the Mount of Olives. And, and he turned and he wept as he's leaving. He's being driven out by his, his son. And, uh, uh, and Ahithophel said, go get him and get him now. Cut him off now. But Hushai, another counselor that David sent to be in there, said, no, you don't want to do that. You don't want to get, you don't want to get in trouble with the people and do, don't do that. So he didn't listen to Ahithophel. He listened to another counselor. And so David escaped. And of course, that was the will of the Lord, but David escaped. But he never dealt with this anger inside. And this. imagine your granddaughter being violated by your boss. Imagine you're not only that, but he murdered your grandson-in-law. Not murder. He just, he just sent a message to put him to the front. And when the, they're all around him, back away. We know before he died, he killed 37. So what do we do with hurt? I'm not going to show you my shoulder and thank you for not showing yours. Uh, but I want to tell you something. You are wounded. Everybody here has been wounded. Something that somebody has said or done to you has wounded, to you, wounded you. And so what do you do with those wounds? And I want to make three suggestions today that, uh, that the Bible gives. Number one is choose to forgive. Choose to forgive. It's a decision. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 2. There are three things in the Bible that the Bible says I don't want you to be ignorant about. I don't want you to be ignorant about the dead, what happens to the dead. I don't want you to be ignorant about spiritual gifts. And I don't want you ignorant about Satan's devices. And so in, in, in uh, now whom you, if you forgive anybody, I also forgive for if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that for your sakes in, in the presence of Christ. Next verse, verse 11. Lest Satan should take advantage of us for we are not ignorant of his devices. But I want to tell you something. I believe this is the most needed and the least understood of all things in the Bible and all things in our culture. We live in an angry culture, road rage and, and things that are just going on on campus. It's anger, but it really is hurt. It's unresolved hurt that people have not dealt with. So you've got to make a decision to forgive. Why forgive? Jesus expects it. He said this, Go around, heal the sick, lay hands on the sick, uh, forgive those freely you have received, freely give. Are you forgiven? Yes. Yes. Why are you forgiven? Grace. It's been given to you freely. As you've received that grace, give that grace. Jesus expects us to give grace to people, to give room for people. Uh, he also uh, wants us to be, knows we're not perfect. Anybody here perfect? It's not a matter of when you're going to mess up. It's a matter of when you're going to mess up next. Because we're all going to mess up. So Jesus expects me to be a forgiver. And I'm, I need forgiveness because I mess up all the time. And the option of unforgiveness is bitterness. In Hebrews, the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 12, is a single verse where it says, pursue peace with all men. So the Lord has for us a desire to pursue peace with everybody and, and, uh, and, and holiness without no one shall see the Lord, looking diligently lest anyone falls short of the grace of God. How do you fall short of the grace of God? 
by not forgiving, by not pursuing peace, by not giving peace to people, by not allowing people uh, the room that they need to breathe because there's no perfect people you live next door to or you work with. There's no perfect people. So God expects us to be gracious. And if we're not, then we fail the grace of God. And two things happen to us, it says here. Let any root of bitterness, the word bitterness uh, in the Greek, it comes from the word uh, pikria, and the root means to cut. Somebody has said or done something to you that is cutting. And it's so deep. And you say, are you okay? No, I'm okay. I'm okay. But you're not really okay. It cut deep. And so what happens when you're cut deep is it creates an emotional wound. But you don't show it just like I don't show my shoulder wound, but you've got it. And you're carrying that wound. And what happens with that? The second word is springing up and it causes trouble. And thereby, many become defiled. The word defiled means to stain or to die, D-Y-E. And what happens when you're cut deep, it so, it so pollutes your soul. Remember the, the Bible says he restores my soul. All of our souls need restored, but when we don't get those things restored because we don't, uh, we don't love and care for people, what happens is uh, I become an, an, a bitter person and it shows up in my life. And I begin to manifest this unforgiveness. And you'll bump into people this week that are unforgiven. How do you know they're unforgiven? There's a variety of things. People who are suspicious. People who are cynical. People who, people, religious people who are legalistic. They're rigid. They give you no room. Sarcastic people. Angry people. Uh, unappreciative. An inability to give compliments or receive compliments. All these things are things that have littered our soul. And just like you, you've seen some of these things on campuses that have gone on, and when they leave all the litter that's there, what happens to us is th those things have, have trampled us, and what's left is the litter of this junk that needs cleaned out. If we walk in the light, the sea is the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us. We need cleansed. We need our soul cleansed. And the way you get your soul cleansed is by asking the Lord to do that and then forgiving people. No matter how deep the wound was, think about this. My daughter was violated by the king. My son-in-law was murdered by the king. If you don't deal, and that's pretty heavy stuff because you, you got people who are abused, people who have been violated, People who have been uh, forsaken and, and, and adopted because nobody wanted them. I want to tell you something. There is no such thing as an unwanted child. They're unplanned kids. But there's no one unwanted. God wants everybody. So you need to right now say, I am wanted by God and God has a plan for me. Say that out loud. I am wanted by God and he has a plan for me. So I choose. Now, this does not mean you feel good. It's not like Ahithophel said, you know, I'm feeling like I just need to talk to David today. Didn't, you don't feel forgiveness. You choose forgiveness. Amen. It's an act of faith. It's a choice that you make. It's something that you do because it's the right thing to do. They did a study in, at, at Cal Berkeley of 7,000 people on this issue of forgiveness and unforgiveness. It was done by uh, Lisa Berkman. And she said this, this. People who struggle with unforgiveness and resentment have a two to five times higher death rate than those who are, who are able to forgive and not have resentments. This holds to be true regardless of your weight, whether you smoke or whether you drink. Conclusion, loving people are more important to your health than eating healthy. Think about that, all you grass eaters out there and all you aspar <laughs> asparagus lovers out there. I hate asparagus, but I love people. <laughs> Loving people is more important than all these veggies that you eat. And it gives you a longer life. So it's, it's why choose to forget? We choose to forget because Jesus expects it. And I'm going to need forgiveness. But the option is that I become a bitter person and, it's, and it comes out of the pores of my soul. So people say, oh, what's wrong with that guy? And no one will say, well, he's got unforgiveness. But I want you to know that's what the problem is. If you're working with an angry person or somebody who does give is judgmental person or legalistic person, you're dealing with somebody who's been hurt, but nobody's really helped them or talked to them about dealing with the hurt in their life. And so it goes unresolved. 
So number one, you choose, make the decision to forgive. Number two, you consider the price of forgiveness. Because it will manifest itself. I got an email here. I'm going to read you. The light turned yellow just in, just in front of him, and he did the right thing, stopping at the crosswalk, even though he could have beaten the red light and accelerated through the intersection. But the tailgating woman was furious and honked her horn, screaming in frustration as she missed her chance to get through the intersection. She dropping her cell and her makeup. As she was still mid rent she heard a tapping on her window and looked into the face of a very serious police officer. The officer ordered, ordered her to exit her car with her hands up. So he took her to the police station where she was searched, fingerprinted, photographed, and, and placed in a holding cell. After a couple of hours, the policeman approached the cell and opened the door. She was escorted back to the booking desk where she, the arresting officer was waiting with her personal effects. He said, I'm very sorry for the mistake. You see, I, I pulled behind your car while you were blowing your horn, flipping off the guy in front of you and cussing a blue streak at him, and I noticed the sticker, what would Jesus do? <laughs> and follow me to Sunday school. I assumed you'd stolen the car. <laughs> so we choose to forgive because the price of unforgiveness manifests every day in the way we drive, the way we live, the way we talk, the way we deal with people. So, so we need to make sure that we, we relinquish our right to get even. If you've been hurt, you need to choose to forgive, but you've got to relinquish right now your right to get even. What is, well, it's just fair. God doesn't deal with fair. God deals with grace. Fair is justice. Grace is the goodness of God. And so we do things to be like him, to be gracious. Be gracious to people. Let somebody on Ramon Road where they're cut, let him in. I won't let, let you in. <laughs> Marsh and I were driving down this week, you know. You know where it goes down to nothing to one road from three lanes? And a guy was coming, and, and uh, so I had to slam on my brakes because he was coming whatever. So I, I was, and I was going like this. I was going like this, but he didn't care. He was coming regardless. But it didn't impact me because I'd already, I'd already let him in. In my mind, I'd already let him in. I was already motioning for him to come in. Whether he saw it or not, that's on, on him. But the grace to give people room, room to drive, room to breathe, room to live. And that means I got to relinquish my rights, my rights. Jesus was asked by Peter one time, well, Lord, and how, t how many times do I forgive? Seven times? You know the answer, right? Seven times seven. And he wasn't talking about 490 he was talking about getting into a pattern of your life that you live life with grace, that you give people room to live and room, room to breathe. And you realize that what Jesus did for us when he was on the cross and it's in the present active, when he said, Father, forgive them, that wasn't just one time. He kept saying it, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. It was an ongoing active a thing that he said repeatedly because he was in such pain. And if you take that pain, then you want to get even. But he let it go. It said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And that dealt with sins in the past and sins in the future. And the reason why we're released to become Christians is because Jesus on the cross forgave everybody. Not only the thief on the cross, he said, you'll be with me this day in paradise. But anybody who wants it, he paid the price for us and all we have to do is receive that and then refuse to, to get even. That's not what he has for us. He wants us to, to be gracious and, and to be forgiving and then release the Holy Spirit. If you've been hurt, it's interesting that uh, you know, we're, we're ignorant about Satan's devices. One of them is, is unforgiveness, but one of them is spiritual gifts. And the only gift that's in the, spirit, in the plural, the gifts of healings. Because it's not just... And a, a, a lame man walking or, or a, a crooked arm straight. It's people who at the depth of their being where you can't see it because you, you, you've, uh, it's under your coat or under your whatever it is. It's not showing. It's not clear. But you need, you need healing. If you're here today and I'm talking right now and somebody's coming to your mind, that's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit reveals things to redeem things. He's not saying to you right now, okay, go get even with him. That's no, just the opposite. He's saying, this is hurting you. 
You need to let this person or this incident go so you will be free. That's what he wants. He wants us to, to live a life of freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And so we worship with freedom. We, we, we lift our hands and surrender to him. This is, this is how we fight. We do the opposite of the world. In the world, you know, you, you do this. In, in the kingdom, you say, Lord, I give this to you. And when you surrender, this is how I fight my battles. I, I give this to you. You do this for me. You fight my battle. You, you work on my behalf. And he will do that. So Ahithophel did not forgive. And he did not consider the price of unforgiveness in fact, do you know how Ahithophel's life was ended? He went to his hometown after, after David refused his counsel. He went to his hometown, Gilo, which is about uh, just outside of Hebron. And much like Judas, he hung himself, hanged himself. Listen, when you don't forgive people, you are suicidal. When you don't forgive people, it drives you to the point where this unforgiveness has it literally so has littered your soul that it now can and you feel dirty and even though the Lord calls you clean and you you know you're guilt free you don't feel that and you don't you because I was violated when I was 13 or I was whatever has happened to you and I believe me I know I've dealt with enough people that some horrible things have happened you need to make a decision it's a decision not a feeling I choose to forgive I choose to let it go. Jesus paid the ultimate price and he's called me to be gracious like he is gracious. And the third and final thing, and I know you're really happy about this, <laughs> is to continue to forgive. It's not a one-time thing, but it's an ongoing thing. Just like Jesus, it was an ongoing thing. And you make a decision that you're going to be a forgiver. Can you make that decision? I want you to say out loud with me, I'm a forgiver. Once again, with this part, this group over here participating, I'm a forgiver. You know, football teams, we got a coach here, uh, armies, you don't prepare for a game at game time or mid game. You prepare for a game ahead of time. You prepare for a battle ahead of time. We're in a battle. And, and I'm talking about this, and you're going to deal with some stuff this week, maybe on Ramon Road, maybe in Walmart. But you're going to deal with something this week where you're going to choose to let it go. And so you continue to forgive. It's an ongoing thing. I choose to let this go. And it, it, it's down to the little things, but the big things too. If there's a biggie in, that's stuck in your throat right now, a person, or a situation, they got me fired. Or choose to let it go and then act in faith on that. What do I do? This is what the Bible says, Ephesians chapter four. And be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another even as Christ has forgiven you. Express kindness to somebody who doesn't deserve it. Express grace to somebody because they need it. And what you're doing is you're guarding your heart. It is so easy to become hard-hearted. To just get, ah, I'm not letting that guy in. And ah, the Ramon Road, what's wrong with the city? They do this stuff. And we start talking bad about the city. And we start talking bad about people. Let it go. That is no way to live life. How you handle those little things in life determines how happy you'll be and how successful you'll be. Let it go and continue a lifestyle of forgiveness. I choose to forgive and I choose to be a forgiver. And so as you choose that, you know, and the Lord hears that, he's going to give you opportunity for, for, for that to happen with you so that you're no, no longer. And for you, if you, if you can't forgive yourself because you did something or said something stupid, don't raise your hand. But most people here have said or done something stupid. And then you get stuck on that. Has anybody else tried to drive in reverse? <laughs> you know, we, were, we, were, we had chapel here Friday, and all the parking spots were taken, including my parking spot, taken by my son. And uh, <laughs> so 
I had to drive in reverse. I'm not, I'm not a good, I'm not a good driver in reverse. You can't drive looking out the rearview mirror. Nobody's a good driver looking out the rearview mirror. You got to look at what's ahead of you. So you forget, as scripture says, you forget those things which are behind and you press toward the things which are ahead. I, I, I charge toward the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Charge ahead. Be a difference maker. Be a lover. Choose to love. Choose to forgive. And choose to let things go. If something's hurt you, someone's hurt you, or you've hurt somebody, make a decision. Jesus said, if you come to worship and there you remember that, that somebody has ought against you, go make it right. Don't just give mental assent to it. Go and make it right. And if, now, I, I want to encourage you, if you can make it right just by saying, Lord, I forgive that person. Or, Lord, I forget. Do that. Don't, don't do this. Please, Warren, don't do this. Hello? Yes. I just want to call you and tell you uh, that I've hated you for a long time. And, but I, now I forgive you. I've had that happen to me before. Pastor, I just, want you to, I just want you to know that I used to really despise you, but you're not that bad of a guy, and I forgive you. Where's that come from? I don't need that. People don't need that. Let it go. It's between you and Jesus. Now, if it's, if it's something more that needs to get said, like Ahithophel should have gone to David, then you go to him. The Bible gives a clear command. If, if you have someone's offended, you go and make it right one-on-one. -on -one. If they won't listen, then you take somebody else. They still won't listen, then you bring it to the church and you say, you need to forgive. So I want to close by doing just that. Uh, Tim, would you come up here? Jimmy, you come up here. They have the same birthday and they're good friends. But you don't like him. I beat, him, I beat him in basketball. He beat you in basketball Friday. He beat you like a drum. No, I, who won that series? Doesn't matter. You guys won? You, don't get sidetracked here. <laughs> Let me make my point here. I was just, I was just kidding. Sorry. So, so he, he, who did I say has the offense? I got, I'm offended. You're, the, you're offended the offended party because he beat you like crazy. And then he rubbed it in your face. Yeah, like right now. Yeah. Okay, so, so here's what I'm... You've gone to him already and he wouldn't listen. And then you've taken one of your partners, maybe Frankie or maybe Sandy, and, and said, you need, to forgive, you need to forgive him. And you said, I'm not doing it. I got to forgive? You got to forgive him. I think he's forgiven me. For, you know, you're messing this whole thing up. <laughs> I had this really straight in my mind before you walked up here. I go up to him. I, I got to forgive him. Okay, you're going to forgive. Okay. I'm real mad. He's lying about you're real, he's he lying about a game. Okay. I don't like it. So f do you forgive him? I forgive him. Or I don't forgive him. What do you want me to do? Well, no. <laughs> what I'd like you to do is go sit down. You both of you just go sit down. You, just, you messed up the whole thing. But the reason why Jesus said that is because if you have unresolved conflict in your life, I want to close with this quote by, by Dr. Bloomfeld. Unresolved emotional pain wreaks havoc to your immune system, your cardiac function, your hormone levels, and other physical functions. We must be at peace with our past because our life literally depends upon it. You need to stop driving in the rearview mirror and just let it go. If you've done something stupid, and, and you have, okay, we'll just cede that point. You have. The Lord forgives you. The Lord forgives stupid people. And the Lord loves everybody. And he calls us that, to that same thing of grace and forgiveness. So when someone's here and they've taken your seat, you're good. That's my seat. It's not your seat. There are no assigned seats here. Sit where you want. Let the Lord sit you. Okay, we're done. I tried to do it with Tim and Jim, and they messed me up so bad I can't think clear. But I forgive you. I forgive you two losers. I forgive you. You just messed up my illustrations, what you did. So you, it happens every day. In many ways, 
things don't go as planned. Let it go. And I want you to keep your heads up, but close your eyes there. And I want to release the power of the Holy Spirit. The gifts of healings are where he heals at a deep level, at an emotional level, at a mental level. If this thing bothers you, it comes to your mind all the time, uh, at a spirit level, you can't walk in the spirit and harbor something in your life. Let it go. Say out loud to the Lord. Just, just the Bible says we lift our hearts with our hands. Just put it in your hand here in your heart and just say, Lord, I lift this to you and I let this go. Lord, seal up our decisions today. They're acts of faith that we choose to forgive and we choose to be kind and we choose to be gracious and we release you, Holy Spirit, to bring healing to us. Restore our soul by the power of your spirit in the name of Jesus. Would you say amen to that? Let's all stay together, please.